Yeah. Happy Friday, everybody. It's a great Friday afternoon. It's definitely not a Friday afternoon that people are trash talking Brett for not being here. So uh, definitely not happening today. Um, so we've got to go to our chapter six. Uh, before we do, I've got some announcements and some things I wanted to talk about. So please remember uh, group, group projects at the end of the semester. I want you all to start thinking about your groups and your topics. Uh, so please let me know if you've uh, settled on those and people that you want to present with. Again, 15 people in the main class, so it's going to be three groups of five. So uh, it kind of limits uh, who you're going to be in the groups with, but uh, please keep that in mind. Also, for those of you who have completed uh, the professional interaction uh, and done your write-up on it, thank you very much. For those of you who still need something to write up on, um, we actually have Chuck Woods for the VP of Readiness from Boeing who's presenting uh, 3.30 p.m. this afternoon over in Viola Hall 1000. Um, so that would be a great opportunity for you to get a, a presenter that you can actually do for the professional interaction if you're available to do that. Something to think about. Uh, last thing I want to talk about, uh, I've had a few people come and approach me about this, and I want to make sure that uh, we're clear on some ideas. Um, so a few people have questioned or asked me, like, uh, what, what what my suggestions are for preparing for exams and, uh, you know, what uh, what are some things they can do to, to different in the course? Uh, for the most part, I've given you a lot of the tips that I already have, but I do have some suggestions. And some of these are things that I've alluded to already. Some of these may be somewhat new. Um, first of all, if you're taking notes in the class, I would strongly recommend that when you take notes that don't just take notes over the things that are in the slides. Make sure you're taking notes of the things that I say. So a lot of the questions I will talk about will be expansions on the content that's information in the slides, not just the slides themselves. Um, that's true for every single chapter that we cover. So it's make, it's important that you understand the context for everything and not just the information. The slides are our beginning point. They are not the end of the, uh, the presentations. Also, with respect to homework, um, I do think that uh, what you're doing on the homework is going to be helpful, and that's with the multiple choice of not providing an answer. If you're really struggling on the multiple choice on the exam, or if you struggle on the multiple choice on the exams and want some additional advice, or just the exam in general, there are a couple of things that you can do with respect to the homework that will be helpful. So the first one is extra work, which I know that that's not probably what you, what you want to hear, but uh, the way that I used to do the class is I used to have my students provide an answer for every single question, as opposed to providing an answer for just uh, the or, or an explanation for the answer. They'd provide explanations for the answers and the things that were not answers and the reasons why. Uh, that may actually uh, open up a little bit of perspective for you to see why certain things are wrong in addition to things being right. Also, something that I recently re remembered back back in the the olden days, okay, back when your predecessors were here in the uh, two thousand the two thousand tens that that era, we used to do uh, paper based homework, and I would have my students do two forms of writing. Uh, they would do the homework on, and they would basically have that printed out and they would write on that homework and the written answers. And then I would all give them all red pens. And I would say, when we go over this in class, I want you to take notes in red pen about what it is that you're learning from the experience, about what the right answers are, what the wrong answers are. I think that was beneficial to some degree. Maybe some hybrid or some some different, some combination of those approaches may be beneficial for you for being able to uh, hold on to content in the course. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm more than happy to talk to you about it if you're concerned about the pre uh, performance. Uh, overall, I think the performance is fine, but uh, I don't I don't begrudge you the the desire to improve. Uh, you're Truman students after all, so that's going to be kind of inherent in your in your brain in your nature. So I kind of trailed off at the end there. Sorry, guys. All right, I promise it's only upwards from here. It's only uphill or uphill from here. No, it's only higher. I only go upwards from here. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about uh, homework, uh, some multiple choice questions. Uh, so first of all, 612, an auditor's primary consideration regarding an entity's internal controls is whether they do what? So this is control sequence in a nutshell. We need to understand the control sequence to be able to answer this question. So what is the control sequence? Well, we identify the risk. Once we have identified the risk, we actually implement, a, or the client implements a control, and we as responsibles are, are we as responsible, we as auditors are responsible for testing that control. This may be one of those days, guys, where I'm just really struggling with words today. I apologize. All right, so we as auditors are responsible for testing that control, but there was something that I left out that was part of that control sequence narrative. What did I leave out? How do we characterize risk as auditors? Assertions, okay? We have to make sure that a control is addressing the management assertion. Otherwise, the control itself is irrelevant because it doesn't address a risk and controls not addressing risks are not controls, they're just things that are happening, all right? so. An auditor's primary concern, concern consideration regarding an entity's internal control is, is whether they 
affect the financial statement assertions. Why? Associate assertions represent risks and controls our responses to risks. So that's why we're our primary consideration is that. That's the control sequence in a nutshell. Which of the following statements about internal control is correct? I don't particularly like questions like this because it doesn't really provide any context, but this is a decent question and the fact that you have to go through each of the answers. So that does give you some context. So I do like that question from that perspective. That being said, I probably will not ask a question like this on the exam. A properly maintained internal control system reasonably assures that collusion among employees cannot occur. Is that a correct statement? That is not a correct statement. Collusion is a limitation of internal control. So we cannot ensure that uh, that uh, it could not uh, prevent against collusions. The establishment and maintenance of internal control is an important responsibility of the internal auditor. Is that true? No, whose responsibility is that? Management's responsibility. An exceptionally strong internal control system is enough for the auditor to eliminate substantive procedures on a significant account balance. Is that a correct statement? No, we talked about that on Wednesday. Remember, controls relate to transactions and events. And we are do have concern about the information that goes into the financial statements as well. So even if controls are perfect, we cannot eliminate substantive procedures. We still have additional testing to do. The cost-benefit relationship is a primary criterion that should be considered in designing an internal control system. Didn't really talk about that, but that's the only one left. Does it make sense? Yes. The cost or the cost of providing a control should not exceed the benefit of gain from implementing that control. That's just the nature of accounting. That's that SFAC number eight we talked about back in accounting 367 back in AIS. All right. Monitoring is a major component of the COSO internal control integrated framework. That's a statement of fact. Which of the following is not correct and how the component or the company can implement the monitoring component. So monitoring can be an ongoing process. What do you guys think? Should monitoring be an ongoing process? It can, and it probably should be an ongoing process because remember monitoring is updating a control system for addressing new risks that are present. Monitoring can be conducted as a separate evaluation. We haven't really talked about it, but what do you guys think? Do you think that can be conducted as a separate evaluation? Sure, okay, we can conduct that outside of the financial statement audit, that shouldn't be a problem. Monitoring and other audit work conducted by the internal audit staff can reduce internal external audit cost. So this is effectively saying if controls are good, it reduces the amount of work that we have to do as auditors. What do you guys think? That's the entire nature of controls in a nutshell for auditors right there. Good controls, less work. Okay, I don't know why I put my thumb down. All right, um, the independent auditor can serve as the entities in control environment and continuous monitoring. What do you guys think about that? So the auditor is responsible for testing and evaluating controls, but if they're also responsible for maintaining controls, they're basically testing their own work. That is a violation of this thing called independence that we have to have as auditors. So D is not proper that way. That being D is our answer. Cannot be not correct. All right. Question number 17. Regardless of the assessed level of control risk, an auditor would perform some what? We actually just talked about this. Auditor would report or perform some substantive procedures regardless of the assessed level of control risk. Again, think about it if we said the control risk is not just low, it is like the lowest that we've ever seen in all of human history. It's like the perfect system of controls. There are literally no risks available. Does that mean that the financial statements cannot be manipulated? No, they can be manipulated after the controls. Because remember, financial statements are an aggregate measure. Controls detail are deal with individual transactions. So we do still have to do some work at substantive procedure level. So that's our answer. Substantive procedures to restrict detection risk for significant transaction classes, C. All right. <laughs> I like this question. Assessing control risk below high involves all of the following except what? So if we want to assess control risk below high, are we going to identify specific controls to rely on? Yes, remember to assess below high that, remind, that, that specifies we are going to be using a reliance strategy. That is the only scenario that we can set to controls below high. If we do not utilize our reliance strategy, we cannot set control risk below high. That's when we say substance strategy, default control risk high. So reliance strategy means we're going to identify controls to rely on. We're going to get some assurance from those controls. Concluding that controls are ineffective. If controls are ineffective, where is control risk going to be? High, okay. So that's the opposite of what we're talking about. So B is probably our answer, but let's go through the rest. Performing test of controls, okay? If we're going to set control risk below high, do we need to test controls? You betcha. You bet we do, okay? Analyzing the achieved level control risk after performing test of controls. Do we want to know what our actual control risk is once things or test of controls are done? Yes, we do, okay? So only the answer that makes sense is B there. Uh, I don't like this next question. 
Which of the following audit techniques would most likely provide the auditor with the least assurance about the effectiveness of the operation of control? You don't think they could have written that question a little bit more clearly. That's just really, really odd. So in other words, which is the least reliable test? Now, the, that's one reason I don't like the question, okay, because of the way it's worded. But the other thing is, is there's two possible answers here. There's two possible answers because we've talked about different types of uh, tests that can be performed, okay? And uh, so uh, what could be those answers? Well, we talked about the oral evidence, which is that lowest level. A, audit evidence, E, external evidence, I, internal evidence, O, oral evidence, U, you know it. <laughs> yeah, that's the mood I'm in, I'm actually using it, okay? So oral evidence is observation and inquiry, which are both listed up here, okay? Inquiry of entity personnel, observation of entity personnel. So if you answered two of these are correct, that's that's effectively correct which I asked this question, not because I think it's a great question, but because I do want to talk about it to make sure that people can identify that uh, the question itself is not relevant. What's relevant is, is that can you identify why two of the answers are correct instead of just one of the answers being correct? I have to think outside of the box on that one. So I guess by that context, I do like the question, but I don't, I don't like the question at all. All right. Uh, question number 21, SOC 1 type 2 reports issued by the service organization as auditors typically do what? Let's review. A SOC 1 report relates to internal controls and finan over financial reporting in place at a service organization. In other words, some sort of service organization for our client provides services that affect the client's internal controls over financial reporting. So we have two options. One option is a SOC 1 type 1 report. One's a SOC 1 type 2 report. So let's talk about both of these because delineation is really important. A type 1 report assesses what? The blank of controls. Design, okay? At a point in time or over a period of time? At a point in time, okay? Design of controls at a point in time. That's SOC 1 type 1. So SOC 2 type 2. Does SOC 2 type 2 assess design? Yes. Does it also address assess something else? Operating effectiveness. Very good. Operating effectiveness for a period of time. Okay. Operating effectiveness. Design and operating effectiveness for a period of time. Which one provides more assurance, you think? Type two by a long margin. Okay. It's not just it's not just saying controls are designed properly, but saying controls work. Okay. SOC two or SOC one type two is going to be more assurance than SOC uh, SOC one type one. So going back to the answer, SOC 1 type 2, it assesses whether the service organization's controls are suitably designed and operate effectively. Answer D. That's what we're looking for. All right. Let's go on to some problems here. Cook CPA has been engaged to audit the financial statements of General Department Stores Incorporated. They're not going to have sufficient time to perform all the necessary field work in July, so not a year end, but they can form some at interim date on uh, April 30th. So about a month before, the, or two months, yeah, two months before uh, year end. After the accounts adjust to the interim date, Cook will also perform substantive procedures covering the transactions for the final two months of the year. This will be necessary to extend Cook's conclusions to the balance sheet date. Okay, so there's some interesting questions here, some interesting concerns. So we talked about interim testing and the nature of interim testing. And ask questions related to this. So let's make sure we understand this because there's a few different dimensions we need to consider. Describe the factors that Cook should consider before applying substantive procedures to General's balance sheet accounts as of April 30th, 2021. All right. So primarily one of the things we need to consider is we need to understand at a basic level what we believe detection risk to be. Okay. Because detection risk determines what our substantive procedures are going to be. Now, what determines defection <laughs> risk in an audit? Okay, what factors? Inherent risk and control risk, and obviously audit risk, but audit risk is a constant. So, effectively, inherent risk, control risk, risk of material misstatement. Is it possible to assess a uh, risk of material misstatement if we don't have control risk assessed? Probably not. So, we need to at least have an assessment of control risk. If possible, we need to have a good idea of what we think control risk is going to be. Close, close enough to achieve the level of control risk. So remember, assess control risk is before we test controls, achieve control risk is after we test controls. Which one's going to give us a better idea of risk of material misstatement? Probably achieve control risk, the, the actual quote unquote control risk. Now, that being said, we're at interim, so we probably can't get fully achieved control risk because we can't test all the controls we need. But if I test some controls at interim, is that going to give me a better idea of what my detection risk is going to be? What my substantive procedures inevitably need to be? Yes. Okay. 
So that's kind of the first question is establishing what we think detection risk is based on our assessment of control risk. And if possible, can we perform some test of controls during interim as well? The answer is usually going to be yes. It's very rare that we won't perform test controls. Also related to that, is it possible that in some areas we will not test controls at all? What is that called, by the way? When we don't test controls in a certain area, we're doing some type of strategy. Subs Substantive strategy, okay. So if we evaluate and say we're going to use a substantive strategy in a certain account area, is that going to affect the volume of substantive procedures we have to perform? Yes, and that's important to note because if we're conducting uh, inherent interim testing, we may have to do additional tests. They're getting ran by this. Almost want like why can't you guys get this excited about auditing? Yeah. Okay. All right. What's up? It's more about what is possible to do at that point in time. Now, that's an interesting question. I don't, don't want to get too much in detail about it because we are going to talk about the nature of certain tests for certain process areas. Like when we talk about confirmations, confirmations may be one of those things we perform in interim, but we will also perform at a, at a year end to date. And they do tend to take a lot of time because you're basically contacting a third party saying, give us a response. And people tend to drag their feet when they're asked to do things. So uh, that's something that we have to keep in mind that we organize that according to what uh, the length of time it will take to do something. Excellent question though. All right, so again, some considerations. Uh, what, is the nature of, uh, what is the nature of detection risk based on whether we're using a, a substantive strategy or a reliance strategy? And what do we assess control risk at uh, so we can determine substantive procedures? All right, so for accounts tested at April 30th, 2021, describe how Cook should design substantive procedures covering the balances of June 30th, 2021 and the transactions of the final two months of the year. So this one's pretty straightforward. If we're talking about account balances, the majority of our assessment needs to occur at year end because ultimately we're trying to determine what that balance is, if that balance at that, point, that date is correct. That being said, we can still perform substantive procedures during interim, okay? Especially the ones that relate to the controls, uh, the control testing, those account areas that we can get additional information on. But probably more importantly is that we want to make sure that if we perform some testing at interim, that we do perform sufficient year-end testing for those same accounts to follow upward. Now, the example that I always use, and this is not a perfect example, I'm gonna explain why, but imagine that I've got accounts receivable that I'm using said confirmations for, and I said that I'm going to test 12 months of the year. I'm going to test 12 months of, of period balances. So I can test the first 10 months uh, for some amount of confirmations. And then the final two months, I'll take a confirmations for that period of time at year end when I do my year end testing. Now, the reason that's not a perfect series of tests is I'm not concerned about what the balance is at, say, April 30th. I'm concerned about what the balance of accounts receivable is at J uh, June 30th. Now, that being said, do I still get some assurance if I test the first 10 months and then wait to test the last two months? Yes, I do get some assurance. Not as high assurance because I don't have the exact year in balance at April 30th. I don't know what that final balance is going to be. That reflects back on that idea. Remember, we were talking about this, that interim procedures tend to be less effective than year-end procedures simply because we do not have all the information we need to make a decision. Okay. I will say that with respect to substantive procedures, there are going to be certain times and certain accounts that we cannot do any interim testing just by the nature of procedures. If they're really high risk, especially if they're minimal transaction areas where, where the individual transactions are important, we will often defer those to your end to do test work. Okay, But the idea being we would like to do some work, get some of our work out of the way, and then we have less work to do year end. That's the goal here. All right, we got the uh, vegetables out of the way. Let's go ahead and go to dessert. What do you guys say? All right, that's Cost Corporation. We don't want Cost Corporation. We want Dixon, Illinois. Dixon, <laughs> Illinois. Anybody watch the movie that I recommended? Oh, you guys suck. All right, all right. No. You recommended a documentary. It's got to be boring. It's like, yeah, come on, you're accountants. What, what did you expect? Okay, what did you expect? All right, now... Uh, <laughs> I've recommended that many times, although I, Dr. Shano apparently used to show this film as 303 classes, so I thought maybe people had seen it. I don't know if he, he just kind of gave up on that, but who knows? Um, so Dixon, Illinois, we've got Rita Crundwell, who uh, was basically a very well-known horse enthusiast. She had a ranch. She had 400 show horses, 
400 show horses. That's a lot of horses. I don't have one and she has 400 of them. And uh, obviously what uh, she's got that big lifestyle, uh, she was making a lot of money and uh, um, there was no, no problem there. Uh, does anybody know anyone who runs a ranch? Okay. Has anybody watched the TV show Yellowstone? Okay. Yeah. Do you think running a ranch is probably a really high profit margin industry? Probably not. It's pretty expensive. Okay. And I imagine there's a lot that goes into it. So uh, I'm kind of curious uh, if uh, she has 400 horses, a $2 million RV. Good gracious. Okay. She's either the most successful show horse person player, show horse individual ever, or uh, something else is going on there. And it turns out the answer was the second part. Something else is going on is that she was defrauding the uh, city. So before we get into the facts of the case, let's just go ahead and talk a little bit about this, because I like doing background research on, on some of these. Uh, obviously, I, I've watched the documentary and I thought it was interesting. Um, there's some other information. Dixon, or Dixon, Illinois, not Dixon County, just Dixon, Illinois. Uh, if you look on Wikipedia, its current census is just about 15,000 people. Now, for context, how big is Kirksville? Does anybody know? It's about 17,000, okay? So very similar size to Kirksville, Missouri, all right? And uh, Rita Crunwell, uh, she embezzled $5.8 million, sorry, sorry, $53 million total, $5.8 million in the last year, okay? So basically, like 12% of that could took place in the last year of the uh, fraud, or it was just kind of an insane amount. But uh, $53 million over the course of the, uh, over the course of a fraud. For a, con con or a city that was the size of Kirksville. All right, let's just let's just go ahead and again put this in context. Does anybody know what city city of Kirksville's revenues were for 2020 or the 2023 2024 fiscal year? Forty million dollars. She stole more in this fraud than this than this city likely had in annual revenue sources. So that's just an incredible amount. And it's interesting because it goes back to something we talked about with, with respect to uh, the cost corporation. She didn't start out with a massive fraud. It wasn't like she was just like saying, I'm going to take all their money ever. OK, that's what she was doing at the end. But she probably started out. She probably said, I, I, I just need a, a few hundred dollars to get myself through and I'm going to pay it back. And she did it and she realized she got away with it. And then the, the fraud gradually grew in scale and progressed and moved on. And eventually uh, she got to, uh, she got to the point where. Uh, uh, she was able to just basically write checks, and eventually she was writing she was writing checks to herself so large that she was effectively bankrupting the city. She was saying, "We've got to do spending cuts." And even th that final year, that five five point eight million that she stole, that was subsidized by a five million dollar debt issuance that she had the count or she had the city take out. So she was basically bankrupting them, and then saying, uh, "It's uh, yeah, I still need more money, so you're gonna have to go even even further in debt." It's like that scene in Goodfellas when the guy gives up the restaurant, you know, and then the, the mafia starts stealing more from him after they 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 become partners in the restaurant. Yeah, it's just she was just trying to burn Dixon Dixon to the ground. That's kind of what it felt like. Anyway, so not particularly uh, not particularly insightful fraud. Basically, she opened up a bank account at one of the other. Uh, at one of the local banks, and then uh, she kept it in kind of a disguised term. The bank just assumed that this was uh, going to be used for city purposes. And so, uh, yeah, she had she was constantly traveling doing her shows, but she was very, very adamant that while she was gone, nobody touched the books. She was the only one who touched the books because nobody understood her financial system, all right? Now, we're going to talk a little bit about it when we start getting into the breakdown of the fraud, but uh, that certainly rings alarm bells to me when I hear something like that. And the way the fraud was discovered is somebody else actually took over. She, another uh, individual employee was actually uh, looking at the uh, bank information and said, wait a minute, this, these bank statements don't appear to have anything to do with the city's operations. Like, oh, that's because they're going into her coffers. They're going into her own pocketbook. And yeah, uh, settled a lawsuit for $40 million. And Clifton Larson Allen, who was the auditor, um, had to pay like $35 million of that. Now, it's very interesting because Clifton Larson Allen was a... Uh, they were the primary auditor, although interestingly enough, this company was so small, or sorry, this audit client, not company, the city was so small that they outsourced the services. They basically took the fee and they paid another auditor to do the work for some, some fraction of that. So I don't know what the actual audit fee was. I did like three different web searches to try to find out what the Dixon County, Illinois fee was. I do know the city of Kirksville for uh, the last annual fiscal year, they paid $36,000 in audit fees, Okay. That is not a lot, okay? Auditors are used to getting on at least, uh, least 
uh, six figures on uh, traditional audits, especially public or large public auditors like this one. So the amount of work they did had to be minimal. I actually did the math. I, I when I was working in, uh, at KPMG, which is right around this time, uh, I was uh, being billed out at four hundred dollars an hour. So if you do the math, thirty six thousand dollars, four hundred dollars an hour. It's ninety hours for an audit, which given the scope and scale of this particular operation, that was probably not enough to be able to identify. So $36,000 out of fee ended up having to pay $35 million. I'm gonna say that uh, CLA probably ended up in the red on this one. They probably ended up in the red a little bit. Now, one of the most interesting things that I wanna talk about has to do with, uh, we're gonna talk about the uh, deficiencies here in just a second. Um, this is a kind of uh, relates to the audit and the due diligence. Actually, I'll wait until we get to part B. So let's actually do part A, then I'm going to show you something in part B that's kind of interesting. So uh, part A, identify the internal audit or control deficiencies that allowed the fraud to occur and continue for such a long, long period of time. Okay. So there's one that should be transparent. And by this point in the time you've spent two classes with me now, you've heard me talk about it in all of AIS and most of this particular course, there should be three letters that should be just blaring alarm bells that you're looking at for right now and did not exist in this. What are those three letters? CAR, C-A-R, segregation of duties. There was none, okay? There was none. How common do you think that is uh, for a, a city of this site, size? It's actually quite frequent. We actually have a city manager who has a very similar role here at uh, Kirksville. What is the solution for Kirksville, you think? They can't segregate duties because they can't afford to hire three different people to do this responsibility. It's one person and uh, gets paid a reasonable salary, $80,000 a year. That's not enough to buy the way own a ranch uh, for 400 horses. Sounds like a lot of money, but it's not that much money, okay? So they can't really afford to hire people on for that. So what would what would your uh, solution be if that's the case? If you knew that this one person has no segregation duties responsibility and you're on the city council or you're part of the oversight group, what would you do? Review her work? Scrutinize your work very thoroughly. Make sure you have an understanding, uh, a, a detailed understanding of it. All right. So that would be one case. Now we hire people to do that, right? Okay. We hire people to do that. Can we necessarily trust the auditor to do that? First of all, the auditor has limited scope. Secondly, the city controller or city controller, in this case, uh, uh, whatever Reed Prinsmill's uh, position was, she knows what the auditors are going to be looking at, looking for, so she can manipulate that information. So it's probably still up to our responsibility to make sure that we have some oversight over her activities. Particularly, we want to make sure that we have at least a review or a reconciliation of that. So there does need to be some responsibility on the part of the council, which it appears there was none. They just trusted her outright and implicitly, which I'll tell you right now, good old Zach Burden, he does not, he he probably trusts uh, Mary McComber, who's she's a city controller, but I'm gonna st still say that he probably reviews the work pretty thoroughly. So thank you, Zach. Uh, I don't think he watches these videos. Uh, anyway. Um, so that's going to be one. Um, so what are some other controls we identify? Well, there was deposits to a bank account, okay? Really large deposits to a bank account. Would that have been something that probably should have had some administrative review, some oversight, like saying, why are you putting such large money in an account we don't know about, okay? Also, when we talk about cash accounts and we talk about balancing out cash, cash what is a very, very easy way to determine where cash flows are coming from? Something you learned back in 302 to, uh, to learn how to balance your bank accounts. Is that reconciliation? Okay. The reconciliation is not only just to make sure that the cash you have matches the cash in the bank, but what are those sources of cash? Determining what the sources of cash are and what the flows are related to. All right. And then uh, there's also something that relates to fraud. Um, so... With respect to uh, Rita Crundrill's responsibility, whenever she left, she said, nobody touched the books. Is that a rational approach for an organization to take? No. So not only do they want to have people who can have redundant responsibilities just so they can cover those responsibility areas when somebody's absent, but also that can be served as a second check because if somebody's doing something nefarious, having somebody else do part of that responsibility area is going to find that. In fact, many organizations, they require their employees to take mandatory vacation for this very reason to ensure that frauds are not occurring, okay? So that's something to consider as well. All right, auditors failed. The auditors failed, why? Why did they fail? At a very basic level, we can say that the auditors were not being paid enough to do their job because uh, we're probably saying that on a $36,000 fraud, they're probably like saying, you know, I, I buy lunches that are more than that. So that's probably what some of the CLA partners were thinking about. This is basically pro bono work, so they weren't not uh, they were not doing their job. But 
at their job level, what should have been, been the first question that they should have been asking? Why is there no segregation of duties in this area? Why is there no segregation of responsibilities? Okay. And if there's no segregation of duties, why don't you actually have some sort of administrative oversight over the work that she's doing? So do you think that the work of CLA was probably really, really detailed and diligent outside of this glaring deficiency? Probably not. I have a piece of evidence that might prove that, okay? Bear with me, okay? Here's a picture from the testimony of the court case. This is an example of the invoices that were legitimately sent from the Illinois Department of Transportation. Here's an example of the invoices that Rita Crudnell faked as part of her fraud, all right? Now, can anybody notice, just at this level, I haven't even zoomed in yet, can anybody notice like one big no uh, difference between the two invoices? That, yeah, the headers are completely different. This one says Illinois Department of Transportation. This one just is an invoice, okay? And if you zoom in, they look very similar. The words are almost the same, but it's a completely different font, first of all. I'm going to say, that's just lazy work. I could have gone into, I could have gone into MS Paint back in two, the mid-2000s, and I could have just taken an actual invoice that was scanned in and then just blanked out everything and created one that looks more like this than this one. This was not a sophisticated fraud, not something to pick up. This would be something that the auditors are picking up saying, why on earth is the font different on these invoices than this one, okay? And she may have had an explanation, said, well, these come from a different part of the, the administration department, okay? That would have been something that as an auditor, I would have said, oh, that explains it. Let me investigate and make sure that's actually true. There's also another thing that you might notice if you drill down really quick. I think some people might have noticed it already. So if I go to the actual phony, uh, the phony invoice, location, local section, route, sectin, there are typos in the fraudulent invoice, okay? It's like when you get those email scams and you, you just like somebody somebody's saying, I, I am a, I'm a colleague of yours from uh, this city and it's it written in a completely and totally indecipherable uh, language. You say, okay, this is probably not somebody who is a professional in my area. This was probably not something that was released by uh, the uh, state of Illinois. They probably would have picked up on the fact that there's a typo in their form invoice. So should this have been something that CLA picked up on? I mean, we're picking up on it in our classroom and we're not even auditors. Now, Granted, I'm pointing you the ways to look for, but I'm sure that if I were to say, identify all the deficiencies in this, in this invoice in comparison to this invoice, you all probably could have picked that up like that, okay? It would have been very, very easy. This is not rocket science, okay? Which means, by the way, that auditing is not rocket science. So I would say that not only was uh, were they deficient in identifying a very, very basic lack of segregation of duties, but they weren't even doing thorough evidence testing because this is a very, very clear piece of evidence. And that's why I don't feel particularly bad about them getting fined for $35 million to try to make up that disparity of fraud, because this is something they should have picked up very, very quickly. All right, last one. We've got some uh, controls testing, some controls testing. So what are we doing here? Let's go ahead and go back to the work paper. So we've got some control activities listed out here. So each of these control activities do relate to certain assertions. Now, by the way, You'll notice authorization is listed an assertion. And that makes me angry because that's not a real assertion. But ignoring that, we've identified controls. We've identified the assertions that these relate to. And what we've done is they have already identified that they have to select a sample of a certain number of items. And they're going to test all those items. And in doing so, they're going to test these uh, controls. Now, the nice thing is, is that the vouchers, so real quick, the vouchers are basically all documents that occur in the purchasing process, which we learned about in AIS. The purchasing process involves a uh, purchase requisition, a purchase order, a receiving report, and then a vendor, a vendor invoice. Okay, So these are all documents that go in there, as well as controls related to each of these documents that are there. So the good news is we select one voucher. We can select, test five controls simultaneously by looking at evidence, which that's working smarter, not harder. We like to do that. We like to actually test multiple things simultaneously. But what we're going to be doing is every single voucher, we're going to be looking for certain details, five details to be specific. And we're going to say, if that detail exists, that control is effective for that particular observation. If that detail does not exist, that control is not effective for that particular observation. So let's go ahead and let's do one as an example together. And then we're going to walk through the rest. Uh, I'm going to get the answers for the rest because I don't necessarily want to work through everyone. So the good news is, we're not doing all 75 uh, sample items. We're only doing four of these. The 71 additional items are all deemed as effective. So for 164210, okay, let's just go ahead and go through each of these items. 
Document package includes all documents appropriate for the transaction. So you'll notice here we got our voucher package, which has got the voucher list, as well as the document items that are listed in here. You had to scroll through and you identify as the purchase request in here, okay? Is the uh, purchase order listed in here? And then receiving report. I don't know why I'm scrolling with the mouse button. It'd be so much better, faster to do this. And then we got the vendor invoice, okay? So these are all the documents here. So that first control appears to be okay. So we're effective there. The purchase requisition is signed by a supervisor. So let's go ahead and go to the purchase request. Now, what's the requisition, by the way? The requisition, that's an apartment saying, we need these goods. Can we please get an order from the supplier? So this is an internal document that's issued from one department to the purchasing department. So the purchase request, actually, let's go down to the purchase request. And it has to be signed by a supervisor. So there's the approval right there, okay? There's the approval. So we're good there. Purchase order is signed by an authorized purchasing agent. Now, we don't necessarily have a list of authorized purchasing agents, but we're going to assume that if it's signed, that it's somebody who's authorized to do that. Oh, look, authorized purchasing agent. Yeah, there we go. I'm not going to take a stamp on that, by the way. If I had a list of authorized purchasing agents, that would actually be a long way to make sure that that's the case. But ignoring that, that we don't have that in this case, we'll assume that this is an authorized purchasing agent. Okay. All right. So we're good here. Quantities on the vendor invoice agree with the related receiving report and purchase order and an invoice mathematically correct. So we're doing a VAA test here. We're making sure that the numbers that are in each of the previous documents match what the, what the amount is in the uh, invoice. So let's go ahead and go to the vendor invoice. Oh, there is. There's one. Okay. Well, it shows you how long since I've looked at that. Okay. So good. We've got an authorized purchase agent. Do we have that? Do I have that in my drive? Oh, sorry. It's on the show. On the sheet itself. Okay. Okay. Oops, I'm looking at the wrong one. So inventory tester controls. Okay. So it's actually in the sheet. Oh, right down here. Okay. Wow. Okay. So I there was the control there. Then anyway, and uh, I was saying I was looking for the control, but the control is already there. All right. Now I feel really good. Okay. I'm about ready to say dismiss class, dismiss, because we're just done. No, we're not done with this testing controls yet. Not done testing controls. That would be a high point to win in the day. So again, we have our invoice here. Our invoice basically says that we want to go back and want to make sure that the numbers that are on the invoice are consistent with all the other previous ones, the purchase requ requisition, the purchase request, uh, the purchase order, and the uh, uh, receiving report. And so we match that. And do those all match up here? Yeah, we're good here. And the final thing, all documents in the voucher package have been stamped paid, okay? So we got to make sure that there's that paid stamp on each of these, okay? That stamp here, which exists on all of these. So this first one, this first dip voucher is kind of our example voucher. And if we go over here, we can just say effective for all of these, correct? Kind of want to drag and drop, but I'm not sure what that will do to the other sheet. So we're just going to go and click it in. All right. So let's go ahead and go through the rest of these and make sure that we have the answers correct. So uh, the next voucher, 185423, uh, control activity number one. So what do you guys think? Effective or not effective? That's effective. So it contains all the all the uh, documents. Okay. What about number two? I hear deviation up here. Does we guys need deviations? Anybody else agree deviation? Is anybody just really rad, strongly against me putting deviation here? This was a deviation. Okay, so uh, control activity number three. We have another deviation. Okay, number four, effective. Number five, effective. All right. So this is a bit of a concern because the maximum number of uh, deviations we can accept is one, and we already have two, uh, one deviation for number two and one deviation for number three. So that's a little bit concerning. So going on to the next voucher, 190214. All right, first control activity is... Effective, second control activity. We have another deviation. Uh oh, all right, okay. So that's a little bit worrisome, but we'll come back to that here in just a second. What about the third control activity? Effective, good. Fourth control activity, effective. And then fifth control activity, effective. Oh, sorry, that's a deviation, isn't it? Number four isn't, this is a deviation. My apologies, all right. Uh, going to the final voucher, uh, control activity number one. This one's kind of an interesting one. So all the vouchers in there. So let's go ahead and take a look at that because that's an interesting question. This one always comes up and I want to make sure that we're clear on this. 195840. So if we scroll down to the end, 
this is not a vendor invoice, is it? This is an invoice request that's different, okay? So the question is, we have an invoice request and not a vendor invoice. Should that be uh, listed as effective or a deviation? What do you think? Okay, so I, I'm with you on the logic because that is not the document that we need for the voucher. However, we're auditing our client. The client in the situation is the customer and they've requested a vendor invoice. Do they have control over whether the vendor sends the invoice? No. So it doesn't specify in the situation if the vendor invoice is not available that an invoice request is put in that situation. I as an auditor would say, all right, the vendor is not sending an invoice. What is your policy when the vendor is not sending an invoice to create the voucher package? And they would probably say, we put an invoice request like we've done in this document example, okay? So the answer deviation could be correct. If we assume that this is not appropriate, we should not create a voucher without all of the uh, necessary documents. On the other hand, I would make the argument that since they don't have control of where the vendor sends the document, we can't literally call really call this a deviation because it's not something that they've done wrong. So the answer is, I don't know. I'm going to say it's effective for the time being, but I could see the argument where you'd say it's a deviation because the voucher should have never been correct, like, connect, created in the first place. What about number two? Are we effective here? Okay. Control activity three? Effective. Control activity four? Effective. Control activity five? All right. So we go back here, and all of our controls except for number two we can accept that they're operating properly because we've got one or fewer deviations, all right? And we'll talk about that when we get to next week in sampling about what the uh, the rate of deviations we can accept is. It's usually based on a statistical method, even if it's non-statistical sampling, non-statistical sampling. But we do have one item that it appears to be rejected. And again, you may say, I don't care. It's not a real assertion, so I don't care about this control. And if that's your answer, Good job, okay, good job. You get credit for that particular answer. But let's assume this was a real assertion, all right? Let's assume that I look at this and said, this control failed, all right? What do I need to do to my substantive procedures? Now, again, think about this really, really quickly before we move into this, before it is. In order to move into substantive procedures, we need to be sure that the air controls in this area are not effective in, in, in uh, aggregate, not just a single control failure. Because remember, we're addressing a larger risk, not necessarily addressing uh, not necessarily addressing one individual control. So what I'm trying to get at is, are there other the controls that address this specific risk or this this risk area? Are there other controls that address this assertion? Yes, there are. There is another control that actually addresses authorization. So remember, we talked about this on Wednesday. I said, what happens when we have multiple controls that address the same assertion? Why would we ever do that? The answer is for redundancy purposes. If one gets through, then we have another control that actually captures that same risk and makes sure that the risk is doubly checked. That's what's happening here. Even though the purchase request is not signed by a supervisor, the purchase order is actually going to be signed by an authorized purchasing agent to make sure that the purchase itself is legitimate. Does that mean that there's still not a risk present in the first control? No, okay. All purchase requests should be signed by a supervised agent, okay? But that doesn't mean that the control itself fails, and that means the risk area itself is, is inconclusive. Would this change our substantive procedures? Possibly. But in this area, I would, be op I would opt to say as an auditor, I'd be less worried about this particular risk because there are multiple controls that address this risk area. So ultimately, that's what my conclusion would be. Yes? Does it matter if it's like further along in the process, like the second one failed? I would be concerned about the process itself. Okay. As, as far as that actual control, I'd be saying, well, is it possible that then that uh, people could be requesting goods for unauthorized reasons? And uh, I would follow up on that particular item as the auditor. But as far as overall, the risk of unauthorized purchases going through the entire system, I'd be less likely to be concerned about that because there are there's multiple checks for authorization that occur without the, throughout the process. So answer, I guess the answer is, is that I would do still do some substantive testing and increase it, but not by a great scale. Uh, I would not, I would not basically say that the control system itself has failed spectacularly. It would not probably, I guess I probably, it probably would not affect my control risk assessment because there are other controls that are effective in the same area. All right, that does it for test of controls, which means that does it for our homework for today. So we are all done. We will start chapter seven on Monday. Have a good weekend. I'll see you all then.
No worries. The question about exporters is that it states that we have like purchase orders. Signed by agents and um, and purchase order signed by agents. Okay, that is fine. Just I think what they were trying to uh, they were trying to point out is that it should be signed by uh, uh, the purchase order was processed by one individual, which is that signature, and then there should be an authorization for the purchase to take place, which should be this approval signature down here. And because there's no approval signature, that's why the control failed. So uh, this one approval is not for just for the supervisor? So that's a different document because this is the requisition, this is the purchase order. So these are two different documents. Okay, so we should complete all of this. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is the presentation today at 3 or 3.30? I've seen both online. I think it's 3.30. Okay. Yeah, that's... Uh, I looked at uh, I've seen both and have asked around too to have not gotten that conclusive answer. Uh, Dr. Caden will be the ruler of all things in that area, but I'm pretty sure it's 3.30.